okay, we're back at it. We're back at it again. Like I said, I chopped this up into a bunch of different pieces. So we're going, this is my awkward way of segueing you back into the, the final episode, the second half of the final episode uh, right now. Okay, we get cancer, they do not. Nope, chimps get cancer too. But I gotta show everything or else, you know. So I actually had to do a little bit of digging for this one. It turns out it is a pretty common notion that chimpanzees don't get cancer. So you have to actually go pretty deep to find out whether or not this claim truly holds. So I found this paper, let's see, from when? 2018, so as recent as I could find, April 16th. Um, that discusses patterns of cancer across the tree of life, from human to hydra, so all sorts of different critters. And there's this very lovely chart right here that goes over the order primates, the order legomorpha, uh, they're pretty closely related to us, as well as the most common cancer types for these species. So in humans, skin carcinoma, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer are all very common in the overall population. And in younger individuals, we see brain cancer and cancer in the um, uh, hemo let's see, hematopoietic system. Hematopoietic? I think that's hematopoietic. What is the hematopoietic? I think it's blood and circular, or um, blood and bile? Hematopoietic? Blood and bile? Maybe? Blood? Production of cellular components of blood and blood plasma. So no bile, just blood. So blood cancer. Cancer of the blood. Okay, and then under non-human primates, we see chimpanzees have uterine uh, leiomyoma, 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 leiomyoma. See, I don't know the medical terms as well. Leiomyoma. Oh, benign tumors in smooth muscle of the myometrium. So it's uterine, benign uterine cancer. It looks like leiomyoma as well as hepatocellular carcinoma, ovarian stromal tumors, and gastrointestinal, can uh, gastrointestinal cancer, lymphomas, soft tissue sarcomas, breath cancer, ovarian cancer, and uterine, uterine cancer across all non-human primates, and then the specializations for the chimps. So do they get cancer? Yes, they do. <sighs> okay, let's see here. They have far better vision and can see better colors for picking fruit. The tamarind monkey alone eats the fruits and leaves of more than 833 plants from 167 different species and never needs glasses from failing eyesight. We need glasses from failing eyesight because we have lost the natural selection against poor eyesight. There's a reason why ancient humans don't seem to have any indication of, of, of poor eyesight, although I don't even really know how we would actually find that in the fossil record. It is, though, having bad eyes is something that is absolutely going to kill you. <laughs> and myopia is not a good thing if you are an animal living on the savanna. Um, but I, I believe already we know that older populations of humans had less eyesight issues. I feel like that's a thing. Um, that's also just not at all surprising. It's also why we have higher incidences of many different diseases that didn't used to plague us because natural selection was at play. Um, as for that first thing, far better color vision, that's just not true. Sorry, humans have excellent color vision. We have just as many rods and cones as the rest of the hominoids. Um, and I believe the same as tamarinds. Let's see. Tamarin color vision. These are calotrichines. Color vision and marmosets and tamarinds. I mean, let's see, demonstrate the relative performance of 15 calotrichids tested in a series of color vision. Yeah, they're just, they're good, but so are we. There's no indication that I can find that they are actually superior than we are. And that's because we used to do the same thing, <laughs> is pick um, pick fruits, pick ripe fruits. Tamarins are cute though. Hold on, I'll show you guys tamarins. So you know what I'm talking about. Tamarins are adorable. Not to be confused with tamarins. Emperor tamarin, adorable. Okie dokie, we can't even walk around without shoes because of risk of, it, risk of infections or parasites. I walk around without shoes every summer and I've never had an issue. So if you have weak feet, that's your fault and not mine, Ramat, and also many hunter-gatherers also walk around without shoes. So if you have weak feet, not your fault, not uh, anybody else's fault but yours, sorry. Uh, let's see, they also have far more nerve fibers. No, they don't. They have thick meninges to protect their brain from trauma. That's to be expected for anything arboreal, by the way. <laughs> the, you sh if you are arboreal at all, you should have um, protection for trauma in the brain. So that's an adaptation. 
not like something that humans like <laughs> never had. Presumably, the idea is that we actually evolved from uh, a quadrupedal pronograde um, arboreal primate. But let's see. Chimps have thick meninges. Have thick meninges. Let's see. Aw, cute chimps. How chimps outmuscle humans. Fast switch muscle fibers. Hey, remember when I said that earlier? Why don't apes have bigger brains? Yeah, I'm not seeing anything on like the actual meninges. Just all, literally they're going over all this stuff that I already mentioned earlier. Cool. All right, more nerve fibers. Already said that's not true. There's no such thing as outdoor allergies in any primate species, yet many humans have them all the time. Yeah, the reason why humans get them is again, that natural selection thing where we just don't have it anymore. Chimp allergies. Uh-oh, inhalant allergies in chimpanzees. That's no good. <laughs> Diagnos diagnosis of inhalant allergy in chimpanzees. So I guess they can't get allergies. Okay, let's continue seeing what else he's getting wrong. They have far better hearing. No, they don't. Humans have excellent hearing and so do chimps. We both have excellent hearing. We both have a highly developed inner ear. Um, far better bone density, two sep- oh, okay, but wait, the bone density thing before we talk about the one that just- Okay. Chimp versus human bone density. Let's see what we find here. Bone mineral density in chimps and humans. And what else? Ooh, macaques. Macaca fuscata. Macaca fuscata. Cortical bone area for chimpanzees was almost the same as that of Japanese macaques, whereas the equivalent value in humans was about two-fifths of the others. Values for the other three properties were constant among these three catarine species, so chimpanzees do not particularly resemble humans, but are more similar to digigrade macaques in the terms of bone properties. The constant trabecular bone index and trabecular density value in these species may suggest that a certain amount of bone or of trabecular bone in total bone area is necessary to achieve normal bone turnover. The physiological metabolism of a bone, including cortical bone density, may be conserved in these catarines. That's kind of interesting. I didn't know that. When was this done? 2003. Let's see here. Recent origin of low trabecular bone density. Uh-oh, are you going to tell me we identified what actually happened? Humans are unique when compared to our closest living relatives and fossil hominins, and having an enlarged body size and lower limp joint surface in, com in combination with relatively gracile skeletons. Some analyses have observed that at least a few anatomical regions appear to have low, relatively low trabecular bone density, which is why that previous paper was talking about only in some areas are we two-fifths that of macaques and chimps. Here we test the hypothesis that recent humans, let's see, blah, 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 they're testing about when this happens. Results show that only recent modern humans have low trabecular bone density throughout the limb joints. Extant hominins, including pre-Holocene Homo sapiens, retain the high devil seen in non-human primates. Hmm. Including pre-Holocene humans. That's going to be really problematic, isn't it, for that genetic entropy as far? Because I thought the archaic Homo sapiens were supposed to be inferior, a result of genetic entropy along with Neanderthals. Results from increased uh, sedentism and a reliance on technological and cultural innovation. So, yeah, we do have lower bone density. That's true. But we haven't always. Not our species doesn't have lower bone density. Our recent species does. So... Would you not say that that's falling into the same category as the allergies and what was the other one? As allergies and what's the other one? Cancer. Yeah, allergies and cancer. Hmm, how interesting. It's almost like when you take away natural selection, traits that would have normally been selected away due to a rough and tumble lifestyle disappear or are more prone to disappearing. But... If you were thinking to yourself, man, Romatz, at least he's come up with some, some decent ideas here. At least he's kind of working at it. I want you to appreciate something for me, okay? I want you to appreciate this next sentence that is written in this text. And I want you to compare it to what you've been hearing. And think to yourself, I wonder if Romat wrote all this himself, or if he copied and pasted it from somewhere else, or if it's some combination of the two. Because the next thing that you're going to hear is so beyond asinine that it, I know I keep, I know, I know I keep saying this, but we really do keep like managing to lower the bar even further. Raw mat is impossible to underestimate. Okay. 
You ready for this? <laughs> they have far better hearing and better bone density. And they have two separate bones in the forearm and lower leg, giving them far more mobility than us. He's talking about the radius and the ulna, you know, our two separate bones in our forearm, and the tibia and the fibula, our two separate bones in the lower leg. Human skeleton and chimp skeleton. Let's just, for a moment, if you will, if you will please indulge me with this picture here and listen once more. They have two separate bones in the forearm and two separate bones in the lower leg, giving them far better mobility than us. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Ramat doesn't know the basic long bones of the human body and he wants to overturn human evolution. It's good to keep in mind, you know? Good to be reminded, you know, where he's at. Good stuff. <laughs> I can't with this, honestly. I, oh my God. See, it's, he's wasting my time and I'm wasting yours. You're being forced to listen to this, to consume this media. Humans have greater susceptibility than other primates to most infectious diseases, which could be explained by species-specific changes in immune signaling pathways. AIDS, malaria, and cancer kill millions of humans each year around the world, whereas most non-human primates appear to be naturally protected against these diseases. And they are also significantly more vulnerable to other kinds that we have a natural immunity to, or that we can just shrug off, like most respiratory illnesses. It's a trade-off. It's a trade-off, and also, we don't have natural selection anymore. Food has to pass over the windpipe, which causes humans to choke. More than 3,000 people a year manage to accidentally choke to death. You know, primates do not have this problem. Um, that's actually true. The, the human, the human um, uh, larynx and pharynx are unique, particularly when we consider them ontogenically, uh, or the ontogeny. Ontogeny of larynx. Ooh, I should put human chip. Human chip. Here it is. <laughs> so this is a chimpanzee. I think this is like a really nice and really interesting uh, little graph here. We can see over here that the epiglot at the location of the epiglottis and the difference between where the epiglottis closes and the uh, dangers that you can have by everything accidentally falling down the windpipe because of the specific location of the epiglottis, right? But the interesting thing is when you consider where a child is at, a human child, because human children, human toddlers to be more precise, they fall into the chimpanzee range with this. They don't have, they haven't actually experienced this migration yet. Let's see, uh, larynx, I misspelled larynx here. Uh, 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 where are we at? Chimp human, there it is, and a human infant. So I don't know how well you guys can see this. Let's see if I can pull it up for a little bit bigger here. Is that covering? Am I covering it? No, I'm not, but you guys can't see it super well. So pull. Oops, hold on. I'm trying. I'm doing my best here. Maybe one day. Is that it? There it is. The vocal apparatus of a chimp, human, infant, and a human adult. The chimpanzee has the pharynx about the same relative size when scaled, right? It's a short little pharynx and it allows us to use the epiglottis to cover it up, to cover up the larynx when we swallow and protect the windpipe. The adult human, on the other hand, has a pharynx that is much longer and it allows for greater ease of choking. Um, and here it says, insights into speaking ability of early hominids can come from the comparisons of, vocal of the vocal apparatus of modern humans. Uh, and babies with that of a chimpanzee. To form words, sounds must be modulated with the pharynx, which lies above the larynx. The human newborn baby resembles the chimpanzee with its high larynx and short pharynx. By the age of three, the child's larynx has descended from the level of the fourth cervical vertebra to that of the seventh, and the long human pharynx is complete. Now, that also makes it easier to talk, doesn't it? So it's, it's an interesting, you know, ontogeny recapitulates evolution, right? I don't know, I think this is really fascinating. I don't. I wonder how Ramat would respond to something. Boy, that sure seems coincidental, right? Hmm. 
That's strange. Okay. Humans have arch negative phenotypes, but chimps and other apes do not, only some monkeys do. Apes have waterproof skin, human skin is fragile and weak. Um, humans are significantly better at swimming and are significantly more, uh, have significantly more environmental adaptations for coastal living than chimps do. We're, we're way better at it. It's probably because our bone density is lower. <laughs> so wow, look, it's a trade-off again. Um, we only use two to 9% of our digestive ability in the colon region, whereas apes use up to 60%. I believe this is actually because chimpanzees, I think this is actually discussing gorillas. That would be my, my first inkling here because gorillas are fermenters, right? They've got these big guts in the front. Hold on. Uh, gorilla eating leaves. Gorillas have these gigantic guts in the front. And the reason is because they spend all day eating. They are folivores. Now, full livery is actually their fallback diet method. When fruits are actually available, frugivory becomes their primary method of consumption. But many of these gorillas live in areas that are highly seasonal, and so they've ended up getting these gigantic guts in the front. And these guts are used for fermenting a lot of this food in the same way that large herbivores do. Um, which is super interesting. They have many, much of the same gut bacteria type things going on in their bellies, and just like other ungulate, or just like ungulates do, they spend all day farting because they have to release all the gas that's built up from that fermentation. So naturally, they would be utilizing a lot more of those guts than something that's more omnivorous, like a human or a chimp. Which is why I imagine that this is talking about gorillas, because that number seems pretty familiar. Um, as for blood types, it's interesting. Let's see here, ape blood types. Ape blood types. I'm curious on this one. Let's see what we got here. ABO polymorphism and genetic basis. So let's find, okay. Homo sapiens has ABO, gorilla has B. Chimps have A and O. Panpaniscus has A. Um, ooh, pongids have all of them. Members of pongo have all of them. A, B, and O, as do some helipatids. What about that RH factor? RH factor, oops, in apes. Let's see here. It wouldn't make, I mean, I love racist macaques. They are really cute. Can apes be RH negative? Chimps share some of the same RH variants with humans, but two species have additional variants that they do not share. Pre-immunization of chimpanzees with the antigen can cause hemolytic disease of newborns and subsequent pregnancies. However, this has not been documented. So this is also just not the full truth. <laughs> <laughs> so that's freaking classic. We humans get skin cancer easily. Chimpanzees vary in their ability to taste bitterness. Oh, no matter how much sun they can get, they can never get skin cancer ever, he says. I'm pretty sure we just went over the fact that they have carcinomas, which would be really, really funny. Let's see, carcinomas. Hepatocellular carcinoma. Let's see, soft tissue sarcomas. I don't see any skin cancer on these guys. And skin carcinomas are pretty common in humans. I think that's actually pretty fair. It wouldn't be unexpected in my opinion, although it's not really come, I've never really thought about it before, but human skin, whoa, human skin map. It wouldn't be super surprised. oh, good God. That is not what I meant at all. <laughs> Oh, good lord, that's literally a human skin map. Jesus. Okay, well, this is what I meant. Um, humans have a wide variety of skin types. Chimps don't, right? Chimps don't need to because they don't have the, the latitudinal uh, variants that we do, right? Or sorry, l yeah, latitudinal variants, longitudinal variants is the other way. Um, we're all over the place, and so we have a wide variety of skin types. Guess who's getting the most skin cancer? It's the ones living up here who then travel downwards and expose themselves to sun that they normally wouldn't be exposed to if they were living in the environments that they had had previously uh, had predisposed adaptations to. So I don't know why we would expect evolution wouldn't predict chimps to have the same levels of skin cancer as humans. In fact, the closest thing would be something like a like a rhesus macaque. They have a wide range. Okay, let's continue. Chimpanzees vary in their ability to taste bitterness. Their abilities are controlled by different alleles than those found in humans. I, I think that's gibberish, honestly. Humans and chips, pretty much, we just eat the same stuff. 
Human baseline of creative cooperation, ability to think, speak, ponder life in the future, and collaborate with increasing prowess is unseen in apes. You want to prove that to me? Hmm? What do we think about that? How would we prove that apes aren't creative, that non-human apes lack creativity? Is it because you don't see it in the same ways as you do in humans? What, because humans got to it first? I, I think this is such an asinine, um, uh, anthropomorphic, human-centric view of things, which isn't surprising coming from Ramat, um, and why he's so desperate to not be considered an ape, which he is. I mean, you just are Ramat. Like, it's fine. I, no one really cares if you think you're not. Like, the, it's the same as if a dog was walking around calling itself a cat. Like, you just, you just are an ape. Um, but none of this, none of this is empirical. Imaginative capacity for creativity, religion, none of this is something that can be measured. Or, or even if it was something that was present, how would, you, how would you map it? Would you look for the same thing that you would see in humans? That's a bit strange. Why would it evolve in the same way? Plus, why would they need to evolve it in the first place? What, what pressures require? They're, they're quite happy living where they are. And... Furthermore, why would we expect an extant with a brain the size of like one third to one fourth the size of us to exhibit these same exact qualities? We would expect them to exhibit these qualities on a much smaller scale, which is what we see. I've shown this time and time again in this video and in other videos. Apes have politics. They grieve for their dead. They laugh when they're tickled. They form deep seated bonds and alliances and betrayals and coalitions. All of this is is a part of of their condition as much as it is the part of our condition right yeah they're not creating picassos but no one expected them to okay primates have different haplogroups that would be expected again haplogroups are like that is not at all like, i don't think he really knows what he's talking about here and types of blood that humans do not have because we are not related whatsoever so here's something that's really <laughs> uh, one of the funny things about that is just a moment ago, we looked at some of the blood types in some of our primates. And I would wager, right? I would put money on the idea that Ramat thinks that baboons and macaques are related, or at the very least, that Japanese macaques and rhesus macaques are related. They have different blood types. That means nothing. <laughs> I hate to break it to you. It means nothing. I, you might have a different blood type than your parent, right? Um, these things are, are mutable. So I don't, I, again, this is really stupid as a point. Hymns today display relatively limited sexual dimorphism. Ooh, sexual dimorphism is my bread and butter. 10%, while as other hominoids, girls, and orangutans are highly dimorphic, greater than 50%. Humans and primates, okay, so let's talk about sexual dimorphism. So sexual dimorphism is greatly varied across extant primates, right? You have gorillas and orangutans where males are over twice the size of, of females, right? The males are enormous. The females are like half the size. So really this would be like over 100%, not over 50%, males being larger than females. Chimpanzees are about 20 to 30% sexually dimorphic in body size. Humans are about 5 to 11%. It depends on, on honestly the population you're looking at. And gibbons are not sexually dimorphic at all. Like they actually range some gibbons might even lean a little bit the reverse with the female being larger than the male. So sexual dimorphism varies greatly. That's, of course, that's why he doesn't mention chimps or gibbons. Like, he just mentions the highly sexually dimorphic species. Humans and primates differ in secretory apparatus or activity of steroid hor hormones from the functional corpus luteum. Humans and primates differ greatly in fluctuations of patterns from protein hormones. Reproductive aging patterns in primates reveal that humans are distinct. And then he has <laughs> a blue hyperlink that just says study. <laughs> Um, I find it really funny that we're, like, this would be like saying domestic dogs and carnivorans differ in their secretory activity and steroid hormones. Yes, they do. There is a wide, broad variety across that entire order where there's dozens upon dozens upon dozens of species. I want to imagine that humans do differ from at least one of the many primates that are part of our order. So this means, this means nothing. In fact, I would wager that humans and chimps don't differ very much in their secretory activity or steroid hormones, which is why he had to say primates. That's why he had to bring it up to the primate level. Uh, the reproductive aging patterns, I mean, that's interesting. Humans do have greater longevity. This is typically actually attributed to things like medicine and cooperative care and things like that, that 
we've really dialed it up to 11. But human females also undergo menopause, which is unique to us. Um, it favors the grandmother hypothesis, hypothesis and the role of older females in maintaining um, the, the stability of the group. Older females are key to making sure that the group continues running smoothly. And by sacrificing older females' reproductive potential, by not being fertile till the end of their life, they can then invest in their offspring's offspring, which is in a sense investing in their own genes down the line, right? Um, also, it frees up their hands to bring in more food for the group, which is what we see in hunter-gatherer societies. There are certain periods of the year, specifically periods where many of the females are of younger ages are pregnant, that grandmothers actually bring in more than the highest yielding males. Old women do. Interesting stuff. Human face, okay, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans have fewer lumbar vertebra than humans do. Uh, lumbar vertebra actually differ all across the hominoids, right? I think the I think humans and gibbons have the same amount, but it's because we have to have these stiff lower backs for maintaining upright for long periods. It's a consequence of bipedality. So we would expect, especially this is interesting given that the uh, recent conversations have been that the, ant, the common ancestor of all the, the hominoids today may have been something that was gibbon-like. It was controversial, it may have been gibbon-like, it may have been more of a, like I said, a, a prono-grade quadruped, um, arboreal quadruped. But that being said, if it was gibbon-like, then that means that chimps, orangs, and gorillas have the derived condition and we have the primitive condition. They gained vertebra and we lost them. Um, human faces are proportionally reversed from apes. They're really not, there are actually a ton of different primates that have small jaws and larger brains proportionally. Body hair, the actual difference is not just the number or how short it is, which is vastly different. No, it's not. Um, but the, the fineness of the hair that grows from the follicles. Fine hairs do not perform any of the functions their counterparts do. In more hirsute species for insulation and camouflage, there's a 13.3% difference in the secretions of immune system, 174 difference in cortical, or sorry, cerebral cortex, and in 2005 they discovered the human gene, or the chimpanzee genome is 21% larger. Yeah, the human genome is much larger. Um, usually, or if memory serves, I believe that the, the chimpanzee genome has experienced numerous, enormous duplications. But those duplicated regions, those regions that are duplicated, have like orthologous, or analogous, they have regions that are similar in humans, right? It's just they've experienced new, dupl numerous duplications. Um, oh boy, as for all of those secretions, I don't, I don't really care about that. I would imagine that they probably would be different, particularly in, in areas like the immune system um, and the cerebral cortex. It's like two of the main things that have changed the most, right? The, the immune system due to a lack of natural selection and the brains. Humans have significantly larger brains. This, this is not new stuff. Um, oh, hairs. Got to talk about hairs. Okay, let's see. Oh, this is what I was going to show you later. Or I pulled this up during one of our breaks. This is the role of grandmothers in chimpanzee societies. Uh, grandmas do do a lot of important do do. Grandmothers. Grandmothers are very important in chimpanzee groups. It's been shown that the presence of a grandmother in the group has a positive effect on the reproduction of females. So, important. Important stuff. Okay, this one. <clears throat> excuse me. This was cancer. I know I've got... Um, I know I have around here somewhere. Here it is. Scanning electron microscopy, microscopy of the hair medulla of orangutans. It actually covers chimps and humans too. Then. <clears throat> so she's talking about how different human hairs are. No, humans have roughly the same number of follicles or within the range of, of hairs as chimpanzees do. But even discussing the fineness of the hairs. In summary, we have come to the conclusion that the general structure of the human hair medulla does not differ significantly from those of the anthropoid apes, especially the chimpanzees. Some peculiar features are characteristic of primate hair, such as weak heat insulating properties. That's all primates, including humans, on this paper. Um, and architectonics of the human hair medulla is quite similar to that of the chimpanzee, but the hairs of the back, the crimped and tightly packed filaments, are mostly stretched along the hair shaft. Under a light optical microscope, this hair medulla looks probably like a tight interweaving of longitudinally elongated and twisted bundles. And I would love to see what Ron Matt thinks of this picture. I wonder if he could tell me which one was from the Scandinavian man, which one was from the chimp, and which one was from the orangutan. What do you guys think? Message in the side chat now. <clears throat> so, <laughs> now that you've had the little moment to think, from left to right, it goes um, orangutan, followed by chimp, followed by a Slavic man. From his back and from his head. 
Amazing. Okay, so we've covered body hair. Okay, epigenetic markers act to control and regulate. Yes, the epigenome is indeed different. The epigenome is different between chimps and bonobos too. Does that mean that they're separate species or separate species, separate kinds and not related? What do we think? None of this is evolution, he says, okay? No new information is added. It's gene expression via chemical pathways of DNA methylation. Looking at that in this study, they used a new highly accurate method of studying DNA methylation profiles. Over um, 1,055 genes showed significantly different methylation patterns between humans and chimps. Okay, do you have any idea how many genes there are in the human genome? How many genes does a human have? Okay. So 20,000 and 25,000, you're not really helping your case if like 1,000, 1 20th of that, it's like 5% of unique methylation, which is important because what Ramad is claiming is that the methylation is the primary difference and that it is one of the most obvious of the differences, right? So then it should be that methylation should be wildly different, not less than 5%. <clears throat> Of the, okay, let's see, for highly diverse and methylation patterns. Um, they stated, we also found extensive species level divergence in the patterns of DNA methylation and that hundreds of genes exhibit significantly lower levels of promoter methylation in the human brain than in the chimpanzee brain. This study also reported that these types of brain genes could tolerate very little epigenetic modification outside the normal profile for the human brain. In fact, researchers found that abnormal human brain gene methylation patterns are associated with a wide variety of severe human neurological diseases. These findings show how methylation changes in the brain, in the brain genes are not well tolerated and thus negates the idea of epigenetic evolution in primates. Hmm, this is very interesting. Obviously, brain gene methylation patterns are finely tuned and species-specific in orphan genes, which are also this way helps further prove my point. The authors made the following comment regarding this discovery. Finally, we found that differently methylated genes are strikingly enriched with loci associated with neurological disorders, psychological disorders, and cancers. Like I said, orphan genes are expressed in the brain of a human. In chimps, they're expressed in the mtDNA. First of all, that's not what he said. He said... <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. I want to find this again and, and read it. I want to be absolutely 100% sure that I'm not mischaracterizing him before we go into this uh, DNA stuff. I, I need to find it. Show it to me now. Oh my goodness, please. Orphan genes are highly expressed in the human brain, but not in primates whatsoever. Like I said, orphan genes are expressed in the brain of a human. In chimps, they're expressed in the mitochondrial DNA. Does he think there's no mitochondrial DNA in the brain? Do you... Okay. So I went ahead and tracked down the paper that Ramat was talking about, and I found that the part where he says these findings show how methylation changes in brain genes are not, genes are not well tolerated, thus negating ideas of epigenetic evolution in primates, doesn't come from this paper. It doesn't come from anywhere that I can find. So it, he's citing the paper, and then he's claiming that the paper supports this. But the paper finishes by saying comparative studies of humans and chimpanzees strand um, to identify key epigenomic modifications underlying the evolution of human specific traits. So like, <laughs> where did it come from, Rama? Are you pretending it's from the paper when it's not? I'm shocked that you would, that you would do something like that. That's so out of character. All right, and then we did the orphan genes thing. Okay, so so the whole point about DNA methylation was, yes, there's DNA methylation that's different between humans and chimps. No, it isn't as much as it should be if the two are not at all related, in which case it should be none, or at least very little, only for like key, um, like almost like cellular, meta cellular metabolic processes and like processes related to building a similar body. Um, not less than 5% of total. <laughs> Um, and then we also found that the paper that he cited to support his claim that uh, epigenetic evolution in primates would not really happen is just doesn't say that at all. So really good stuff. Or he just didn't show the paper that he claims says it, which is just as bad. In IQ tests, humans are all fairly consistent. 90% fall within 30 points of 100s, whereas chimps don't even score at all. They can't even make it to step one. <laughs> Who is giving a chimp an IQ test? Here's something interesting. Did you guys know that chimps beat humans out on short-term memory tests? 
Yeah, it's so what they do, I want to show this to you here. Uh, chimps and short term memory. Short term emery. Chimps have more smarts than humans, at least regarding short term memory, new research suggests. The incredible short term or working memory helps chimps survive in the wild where they often make rapid and complex decisions. Um, and you can find the video about there. So this is an excellent video with Kanzi performing that. I think it's Kanzi. No, it's not Kanzi. It's, um, it's over at the, uh, the, Japan, the Japanese station where they show chimps just annihilating humans in short term memory tests. The human neocortex is disproportionately larger than with orphan genes highly expressed there. There's a 60 to 1 ratio difference in gray matter compared to our medulla and brain stems, compared that to 30 and 1 in chimps. So you're telling me it's 60 to 1 in gray matter and 30 to 1 in chimps, but our brain size is 3 to 4 times the size? That doesn't seem to track. Spindle cells of the human brain outweigh, a chimps, outweigh chimps in order of magnitude. That is just nonsensical. Skin microbiome is totally different and misproportionate between us and them. Humans major in Staphylococcus, 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 whereas chimps are purely uh, Corin bacterium dominant. Okay, you can't say they're purely dominant in something if they're if they are pure in something. That would be the only bacteria present in the skin microbiome. Saying it's dominant is fine, but what's interesting is that <laughs> both chimps and humans are both super different from gorillas, which I would wager Ron Matt thinks are the same. The human genome is 130 million base pairs smaller than chimps. He already said that. Again, it's, it's due to duplications. And besides entirely different taxonomic genes and their separate functions with proof, humans are a separate kind from apes. We also have major skeletal differences as well. So he says besides major taxonomic genes and their separate functions of which we discussed none. <laughs> we talked about DNA methylation, and that didn't hold. We talked about the neocortex, which is not at all disputed. The human brain is larger than a chimp brain. No one is disputing that. And with that, the gray matter should be greater. The spindle cells should be greater. Um, I think that's it. Oh, and humans should perform better on IQ tests designed by humans that humans also notoriously do poorly on. Um, the skin microbiome, we do live in different places, but it's also like significantly more similar. Like a, a human and a chimp skin microbiome is more similar, it seems, or is about as similar as a gorilla's and like a baboon's, right? Or a baboon and a racist macaque. Because it depends on where you live. Okay. We also have major skeletal differences as well. Should I go on? Sure, there is a reason to beat a dead horse in this matter. I need to sink this into indo the indoctrinated brain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Humans were originally separated into their own kind within the family, the superfamily hominoids, because it was believed that they were significantly different from the apes. No, it wasn't. Carl Linnaeus did it because he didn't want to bring down the, the um, wrath of all the theologians. There's like a famous quote about it. Only recently have they tried to use taxonomy to prove evolution has no borders. No, it just doesn't. You can't show that there is a border. Like, you, you've had a whole ass book to do that, and you haven't been able to do it. Okay, defining features of primates. God, mm, defining features of primates in order. And then he goes on to discuss exclusively apes. This is a man who is trying to overturn human evolution. He doesn't know the difference between an ape and a primate, evolu or evolutionarily, evidently. Okay, the ape spinal column is made up of 22 vertebra that can regenerate. Primates have pigmented sclera and are dark, brown or dark in color. All primates walk on all fours except for very short bouts of uprightedness. It's a profound disparity. Primates have two separate bones in the lower leg, giving them greater mobility for climbing. Primate appendix is for digesting cellulose. All primates lack a chin. Primate forearms are comparatively longer for walking on all four limbs. Only apes show sexual dimorphism in RBC, uh, phytanic acids. Primates have no language. Reproductive systems are fairly uniform throughout all primates. In apes, the penis contains a baculum, which is absent in all humans because ours is an organ. All non-human primates have 13 pairs of ribs. Primates cannot regrow ribs. Humans can. Primates have no foreheads. Primates have a, a plate of bone that separates the orbit from the jaw muscles. The frontal bones are fused down the midline. Primates display what is known as facial prognathism, or the face protrudes both, uh, both beyond the top of the skull. Primate humerus are on the side of the rib cage. What? Primate spine can repair itself. 
Primates like chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans have fewer lumbar vertebrae than humans. In primates, the foramen magnum is positioned backwards towards the skull with the spinal cord exiting at a slight angle. Primates are immune to cancers and most diseases. All primate faces, skulls have flattened faces. All apes are omnivores and never cook their foods. No human is a raw-eating omnivore. No New World monkeys produce salivary, eh, salivary, salivary, yeah, amylase, yet humans do. And then an uh, NEU... 5GC is found in many mammals, including apes. Humans don't have any UG 5GC. Apes have greatly developed canines with sharp blades. Primates fully recover from spinal damage. Primates have their own specific blood types and haplogroups. Primates have lineage-specific orphan genes, proving they are not related to humans whatsoever. This is going to be a doozy, so let's strap in. So I have created a nice numbered list. It's not actually a numbered list. It's just a, a categorization for all of the claims that we just heard Raw Matt make so that we can go through them one by one and categorize them and see how he hashes out with the things that he's saying. We have just plain false. We have some truth. We have true but. This would be the TB categorization. True but is reserved for things like only humans have a parabolic palate. True but the change from rectangular palate that we see in the proposed last common ancestors for humans in chimpanzees to the parabolic palate seen in anatomically modern humans, this slow grading is documented in the fossil record. So then we have G for gibberish and C for covered. There's a lot more gibberish than you think. <laughs> And I know you're already overestimating because it's raw mat, or rather underestimating, but it is raw mat. Um, to this true but, I want you to remember that the things that are indeed uniquely human, these things are, are going to create a very nice prediction that evolutionary theory can make. If there is a trait that is unique to humans, this trait, if it is something skeletal, should be trackable in the fossil record, right? We should see this slow gradient, this slow change over time, from proposed common ancestors all the way to anatomically modern humans. That's the prediction that evolution makes. Um, now, we can't do this with everything. Obviously, there's going to be some you know, behaviors and things like that that we can't track. But that being said, we should be able to do it for most of these traits on the list. So <laughs> I have listed the defining features of the hominoids by our friend Raw Matthew. Remember, Raw Matthew proposed that this was the defining list of traits for primates but then he proceeded to list like ape traits. So I don't know that he actually knows the difference between an ape and a primate um, or a hominoid and, and a member of primates. Um, it's an order versus family thing, right? Or super family thing. These are pretty like distinct categorizations, but I digress. Remember for raw mat, hominoids are going to be gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, and panins. Panins being chimps and bonobos. So the first thing that he has on the list is 22 members of the spinal column. Now, what we're specifically talking about here is the thoracic vertebra, so the vertebra that make up the upper back. You have your cervical vertebra here, seven of them, your thoracic vertebra, your lumbar vertebra, your sacrum, and then your coccyx, your coccygeal vertebra, your tailbone. So modern hominids, or rather I should say modern hominoids, have a variety of different thoracic vertebra, right? So humans have 12 thoracic vertebra and apes have 13 thoracic vertebra. And by apes, I just mean uh, orangutans, gorillas, and panins. Gibbons retain that, that um, 12 number, right? So what appears to have happened is that we've seen an acquisition in orangutans, gorillas, and panins. So the question lies, what's going on here, right? Or, I guess we should say, um, can we see the difference in the fossil record? So I pulled up this paper called Thoracic Vertebral Count and um, Thoracolumbar Transition in Australopithecus afarensis. So they note that the discovery of a 3.3 million, million year old partial skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis from Dakika, this is the Dakika child, preserved cervical and thoracic vertebra, and shows that Australopithecus afarensis, which is firmly considered to be an ape by these guys, by standing for truth and raw mat, has the 12 thoracic or rib-bearing rib vertebra in hominins prior to 60,000 years ago. So they have the human condition. Right, not 13 thoracic vertebra like other African apes. Actually, I believe orangutans have the primitive condition as well. Let's see, hold on. How many ribs does an orangutan have? Yeah, 
So they have 12 like us. My mistake. I lumped them in, which makes sense, actually. I don't know why I would have... Um, I guess it's early here. <laughs> I'm still drinking my coffee. But this does make sense, right? The idea would be that the primitive condition is 12 vertebra. So the common ancestor of all hominoids would have 12 vertebra, like gibbons, like orangutans, uh, and like humans. And then we see this acquisition separately in chimpanzees and gorillas. It isn't that humans gained, or rather lost a rib, it's that they, gorillas and chimpanzees, gained one. And everyone might have something to do with, with their, the fact that they also independently evolved knuckle walking, right? Which is super interesting. Um, so for this one, I'm going to put true, but, and also we're going to get a sum truth. It's not just plain true because he thinks that all members of hominoids, all members of hominoidia have that primitive condition or have that derived condition of 13 thoracic vertebra instead of 12 and that humans are the only odd man out. It turns out gorillas and panins are the ones that have the derived condition of 13 and they actually make up the minority within hominoids. Humans lump with um, orangutans and gibbons. Next up is spinal column can regenerate. I don't know what that means. I mean, I do, but like I'm going to put gibberish for that. Because there's no elaboration, there's no sourcing, and I, I mean, I guess we could, can the human spinal column regenerate and heal itself? Adult nerve cells in the spinal cord don't regrow after damage. Why they don't and how, okay, so humans don't. Can, can the chimp spinal column regenerate? Does repair of the spinal cord injury follow evolutionary theory? Okay, well, I mean, this is like a good question to ask, I guess. Um, we explore differences in the mechanisms of spinal cord regeneration capability between lower and higher vertebrates to search for theoretical evidence and therapeutic targets for regeneration in the human spinal cord. Okay, let's see what we get in our conclusion. Uh, current basic research shows that the sequence of spinal cord structure repair capacity is reticular formation, cerebellum tract, rubrospinal tract, uh, spinothamalic tract, corticospinal tract, furthermore, blah, 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 blah. The functions at the low evolutionary level, including skin nutrition, bladder function, gastrointestinal function, and sensory functions are also significant. Like, I just, I don't know where that came from, honestly. I know later he talks about regrowing ribs, which is another conversation we have to have. Um, but we'll, we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> okay, so we'll leave that as gibberish. Brown and dark sclera. Uh, so the sclera is the whites of your eyes, and Ramat claims that all apes have brown or dark, dark sclera. Um, that's going to get an F for just plain false. Because great apes often have white sclera. Non-human great apes often have white sclera. So we see it in gorillas. We see it in chimps. It, I mean, we see it in bonobos. I don't really know what else to say other than, like, he's just wrong on this one. Um, but you know, simple Google searches, that's, that's a tough one that can be really hard. Uh, it requires a lot of hand-eye coordination. Quadrupedalism. There's another thing that he says that all apes are quadrupeds. This is also tacitly false. So I'm going to put an F for just plain false here. And I'll show you why in a moment. So gibbons are bipeds on the ground. And in the trees, they actually never use their hands to knuckle walk uh, because they're brachiators. That's what they are actually evolved for, is for brachiation. But when they come down from the ground, like come down to the ground, they exclusively walk on two legs or they will sometimes do like a little hop, right? So they're bipeds, although they don't come down from the trees very often, but they're considered facultative bipeds, right? And in addition to that, bipedality does show up infrequently in chimps and bonobos. Um, less so in gorillas, um, bipedal ape, less so in gorillas and less so in uh, orangutans just because their body weight is so big, but we do see it. We do see it. To Ramat's credit, he does say like, oh yeah, like they don't spend very much time upright, but he gets it just plain false because he didn't consider the gibbons. Okay, two bones in the lower leg. Um, this is gibberish. I'm putting gibberish here because I know what he's going for. But at the same time, 
This is so like mind numbingly stupid that I could just stick like a, an electronic whisk into my ear and just, zzz, and, you know, puree my brains up with, with what that's saying. Ramat doesn't know the bones of the body, right? He, he doesn't know the bones of the body and he wants to overturn evolutionary theory. Having two bones in the distal limbs is like a mammal trait. Like almost all mammals share this unless they fuse the bones together, which happens in many ungulates. Um, but ontogenetically, or sorry, ontogenically, they all have these, these um, two bones. It's the radius and the ulna on the arm, and it's the tibia and the fibula in the leg. So chimp and human skeleton. I know we already went over this, but this is just like, like I, I can't characterize properly how uninformed this is. Um, but yeah, we, we see two, two bones in the legs, right? Tibia and the fibula, tibia and the fibula, um, and radius and the ulna in all the arms. So that's just wrong. <laughs> But I, I'm putting gibberish too because it's insane. Okay, an appendix built for cellulose. This is true in filiver species, but not for chimps, right? Which are, of course, the closest living relative. So for this one, we're getting some truth because it is true that the appendix is more like derived for um, for cellulose, the aiding in cellulose digestion, but not in chimps because they don't. They don't consume cellulose. They're they're frugivores, so omnivores, but they primarily consume um, fruits as their as their plants. So the lack of a chin, um, yeah, this is going to get a true but, and that's because yes, the characterization of the chin is something that defines Homo sapiens, right? None of these guys have a chin, right? Not the uh, not the rhesus macaque, no chin. Not the Siamang, she's got no chin, right? And the chin is just defined as this little bony protuberance in the front. The chimp lacks a chin. I'll show you in a sec, hold on. Gotta move my skulls around. The chimp lacks a chin, right? And the human has one. It has this bony protuberance in the front, right? So this is getting a true butt though because the chin is one of the last things to evolve in the modern human condition. Neanderthals lack a chin, for example. Human and Neanderthal skull. So Neanderthals lack chins, but Ramad, as he does later in this text, will tacitly say that Neanderthals are humans, right? There is no chin here. There is a chin here, right? Um, similarly, Homo erectus skull. Homo erectus lacks a chin right? These guys don't have any chins. They completely lack them. But Raw Man in Standing for Truth would propose that Homo erectus is a human, just like the Creation Museum does. So you're getting a true butt because it creates problems for you later. Okay, forearms longer for quadrupedalism. I'm going to put some truth for this one because it is true that most apes have other than humans, have long limbs, long forelimbs when, com or when uh, yeah, compared to their hind limbs, right? It's not for quadrupedalism though, right? Orangutans don't walk quadrupedally on the ground because they don't really come to the ground very often. They do fist walk when they come down, but they don't do it very often. And gibbons walk bipedally on the ground, but they still have very long arms, right? So the reason for this is because obviously we are bipeds. So we've shortened the length of the arms lengthened our legs um, for efficient locomotion. But Indrid, oops, Indrid skeleton, we are not the only primates that have this condition. Ooh, God, uh, Indrid cold? Oh my God, I'm horrified. Let's go with Indrid skeleton. Indrid cold scares the crap out of me. It's from the Mothman stuff. So these guys here, Indries, they, move around by jumping, I believe it's called saltational locomotion, by jumping through the trees. But their limbs, their lower limbs are actually, as you can see here, this is very much what a human looks like when they're trying to um, walk on all fours. Their hind limbs are longer than their forelimbs. And this is because when they come down, they don't actually walk like this. They stand up and they do this cute little hop, right? Injury hopping. They hop around and they do this in the trees as well on two legs hopping, 
right? Or dashing like that. So not the only condition for humans, but quadrupedalism or longer forearms is characteristic of most members of our superfamily. Sexual dimorphism, false. <laughs> Again, we've been over this and sexual dimorphism is like my jam. Um, sexual dimorphism it has a massive range in the primates. Uh, male and female gibbons. Gibbons are less dimorphic than we are, right? Males and females are exactly the same size. They both have big blade-like canine teeth for, you know, defending their territory. And um, they're monogamous, right? Then you have chimps, male and, oops, male and female. He, God created them. <laughs> chimps. These guys are the same way, right? They're not very dimorphic especially bonobos, They're, their male and female sizes are like relatively the same. Now, gorillas are enormously dimorphic, as are orangutans. Humans, we fall somewhere in between gibbons and chimps. We're not as dimorphic as chimps are, which means we're less dimorphic than this, which is not very dimorphic, but we are more so than gibbons, who aren't dimorphic at all. So you get to just plain false on that one because you didn't do any work. Okay, language. True, but they also have their own complicated systems of communication, like gestures, or the enormously long, beautiful, complicated uh, duets that are sung by Gibbons and Zymex. Okay, the presence of a baculum. This one gets a true but as well. Really, this one should just get a true, honestly, because it is true. Humans are the only members of the great apes that lack a baculum. But the baculum that most of the great apes have, it's like, I mean, it's, it's nearly vestigial. It, it's like, seemingly on its way out. Um, but I don't think we've ever recovered a baculum from the fossil record. I, that's, a, that's like actually a one that does indeed track. 13 ribs. Obviously, we should have 12 ribs because we have or 12 pairs of you know, 12 individual ribs. Um, pairs of ribs, sorry. Because we have 12 thoracic vertebra, right? So they have 13 ribs. We have 12 ribs. Um, but again, this falls under the same category as the previous one because orangutans and gibbons have the same number of ribs as we do. So some truth, but mostly false. <laughs> it just falls under the same category, honestly. Can't regrow ribs. Uh, gibberish. This one he repeats too. He, he likes to do this whole uh, grade eight or apes can regenerate their spinal cord, but they can't regenerate their ribs. We can regenerate our ribs, but not our spinal cord. The paper that this comes from, right, is concerning the cartilaginous structure of the, of the rib cage, right? So the structure that allows your ribs in the front to expand, because obviously your rib cage is not, here, human rib cage, cade. Obviously your rib cage is not entirely ossified. The reason is because you need to be able to expand your chest for breathing. So you can see here what's in purple in the stock footage is cartilaginous, right? So in the paper that he's talking about, humans regrow ribs, question mark, tibs. I just can't type ever, I guess. The paper that we are actually discussing here is regenerate, rib regeneration studied in mammals. And I wanna go to the paper, which is here. And down here. Okay, so what they did is they they analyzed how the the rib cage and specifically these cartilaginous structures, but I believe they also took bits out of the regular ribs as well. How they respond to trauma and pieces of them being uh, being like nicked out. Our results show that full replacement of resected cartilage occurs quickly within one to two months and properly differentiates, but the repair can only occur in the presence of the perichondrium. Then we provide evidence that rib perichondrium contains a special niche that houses con uh, chondrogen chondrogenic progenitors that possess qualities particularly suited for mediating repair. Label retaining cells can be found within the perichondrium that give rise to new chondrocytes. Furthermore, perichondrium proliferates and thickens during the healing period when uh, ectopically placed can generate new cartilage. In conclusion, we've successfully established a model for hyaline cartilage repair in the mouse rib. So what they did is they did this in the mouse model, right? They found that humans can do it too, 
But what this suggests is, of course, that so can apes. <laughs> they did it in mice, they did it in humans, so. Or not didn't, observed it in humans, I believe. So, this one additionally gets a gibberish, mostly because he got it wrong. He thought that we were literally regrowing entire ribs without, like, without, like, alone, basically. Lack of foreheads, this is false, just plain false. Um, the chimps do have foreheads, right? This is the frontal bone, right? The frontal bone makes up this big, heavy, super orbital ridge in the front. But this is technically a forehead, too. This frontal bone ends about approximately here, right, along the coronal suture of the skull. So they do have foreheads. They're just not vaulted and impressive like ours are. And I'll show you. Oh, that almost certainly hurt your ears. I'm sorry. And I'll show you in. Actually, I can just show you here. Australopithecines have foreheads too. So not only does that get a just plain false, but it also gets a and additionally we see this in the gradient as a, as a gradient within the fossil record. Classic. All right, what's next? Okay, frontal bones fused at the midline. This gets gibberish. I don't think that raw Matt knows what he's talking about because frontal bones, if we're discussing the frontal bone in the skull, we only have one and so do chips. Um, the frontal bone is this bone right here, right? I just talked about it on the chimp, but this is the frontal bone. It's a, can you see this? Let me, let me, okay. The frontal bone is right here, right? I don't know if you can see that, but there's a, there's a coronal suture that runs uh, right across the coronal plane. And this right here is the frontal bone. The parietals are of course on the side, occipitals below and temporals are also on the side. These guys do have this, right? They have a frontal bone. And when, <laughs> when he says fused at the midline, I'm not really sure what he's talking about because their frontal bone just includes the superorbital ridge. Like they still have the same coronal sutures. So I don't, coronal sutures, cranial sutures. So I don't, I don't know what he's really trying to say. I, I looked into it and I couldn't find much. So that gets a G. Humerus on the side of the rib cage. I have absolutely no idea what that is. That sounds like he's speaking in tongues, which knowing where I'm at, maybe he is. That gets a gibberish. The humerus is this bone here, right? The humerus is the, the proximal bone in the um, upper limb, the more proximal bone in the upper limb, um, or the bone of your upper arm. So him saying it's on the side of the rib cage, I, I'm not sure what the hell he's talking about. I mean, human and chimp skeleton. The humerus is to the side in both of these animals, in both of us. So, I, I mean, it's to the side in both. So, you know, I mean, you know, business as usual. Primate spine can repair itself. I would have no idea. Again, I told you I was going to mention this later. We're putting a G there because I don't know what that means. Um, and when I looked into it, I couldn't find a lot. And since he didn't source it, I can't actually investigate the claim itself. So foramen magnum. So this was the, this gets a true, but this is very similar to the uh, palate, the parabolic palate. Which is to say, yes, the foramen magnum is more ventrally oriented or to the bottom of the skull in humans, as you can see here, than it is in chimpanzees, right? Because we hold our body weight underneath, right? Theirs is more located to the back. It's a, it's a pulled back more, let's see, in the case of the chimp, it would be a posteriorly oriented uh, foramen magnum. But that being said, <laughs> Evolution makes a prediction on that. And what it says is that we should see the migration of that foramen magnum throughout the evolution of the species. Fora oops, foramen magnum evolution. And what you're gonna see, of course, is <laughs> the migration of the foramen magnum throughout the fossil record. This is a picture that I really like. You can literally see it linearly progress going from more posterior, ventrally moving underneath, right? This is a chimp. We're using the chimp as the common ancestor here, something probably like Sahelanthropus chinensis, or perhaps another Miocene ape like uh, Oreopithecus bimbulii. But you can see it move underneath. Chimp, Australopithecus afarensis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens. So 
that gets a true butt. Raw omnivory. So, oh boy, I don't even know if I should approach this. Raw Matt is known for his really, really weird dietary preferences. Like he did a stent where he <sighs> harvested honey in the wilderness by himself for like six months or something like that. I don't know. That's probably mischaracterizing it slightly, but I do know that he lived in the wild and like ate raw honey for a while. He considers himself a frugivore, a fruitarian. Um, I, I, he only eats fruit or like primarily eats fruit. I don't really care about what raw Matt does in his personal life. But based off of the guts and the teeth of humans, we know that we are obligate omnivores. We have to eat meat in the absence of supplements. So that's not to say you can't be a vegan. You can. You just have to take your supplements, right? But he claims in the book that humans... Where's the book? Where's the text? He claims in the book that humans can't eat raw meat, right? That humans... Uh, all apes are omnivores and never cook their food. No human is a raw eating omnivore. That is so ridiculous. It Like you can literally just look at innumerable numbers of human tribes who eat raw meat and they digest it just fine, right? Is it risky? Yes, you can get things like parasites. You can get salmonella. Wild animals get those sometimes too. Why do you think they're so rife with parasites? It's because they eat so much raw meat. Um, but we can all do it and we digest it and take a lot of nutrients from it. We just take more from cooked meat. Most animals do. If everything could cook their meat, they probably would. That being said, um, something that's also quite interesting about this is that we eat raw meat like in the civilized world too. I like a rare steak. I don't die when I eat a rare steak, right? Um, but steak tartare, that's also raw meat. So I'm sorry, but that's just false. So he gets false for this one. Uh, salivary amylase, um, salivary amylase, so we're talking about the saliva, right, this specific chemical that helps us start digesting our food when it's already in our um, mouth when we're chewing it. This gets a gibberish because he specifically talks about it in New World Monkeys. Um, chimps have it, right? Like, so we have more of it than chimps, higher levels of amylase in, sal in saliva than chimps do, but they do have it which is why he used New World Monkeys, which lack it entirely. He has to push it back and hope that no one notices. Um, okay, canines. He talks about the big blade-like canines that are present in most primates and not in humans. It's true, humans have itty-bitty little podunk canines, although I do have a cousin and she has very impressive canine teeth. But that being said, lacking big impressive canines is not unique to humans. Uh, Marmoset... Uh, oh, you know what? Let's do owl monkey skull. Owl monkey skull. Owl monkeys, like, look at them. Look at their canines. That is very unimpressive compared to many of their relatives, right? Itty bitty little podunk canines for their si for the uh, size of their skull. Very similar to us. We have little bitty teeny tiny canines. Um, and that's because we have low male competition or like low male competition using the canine teeth compared to something else. Um, of course, there are, <laughs> there are primates that have very impressive canines. We can just look. This male chimpanzee has these big, impressive canine teeth in his jaw. Um, so you can see it. Big, impressive canine teeth in his jaw. You can see that. Female chimps also have big, impressive canines. And that's because chimpanzees don't live in harem societies. Contrast that to the sexually dimorphic rhesus macaque, where only the males have these big, impressive canines, females lack them, and then compare it again to the humble female siamang, who has giant daggers for teeth. Females and males both have large, impressive canines because they're monogamous. They lack sexual dimorphism um, in part due to their mating system. So, let's see, so that gets uh, just plain false. I guess we could give him some truth on that, but uh, I'm not feeling that generous. Then we talk about um, new 5GC or NEU 5GC. This is a weird one. I think this is that. Yeah, so this is a mutation that occurred in a coding region of DNA after the human pen and split. After the human pen and split. Can't talk today or yesterday, evidently, but I am a little sick, so cut me a little bit of slack. Um, but it doesn't really do anything that we know of, so I don't know why this is particularly unique. 
when compared to the other regions of human DNA that have changed since the divergence. Chimps also have divergence that make them unique from all other apes, including humans, right? So let's see. The expression previously reported in human fetuses and tumors as well as traits detected in normal human adults must be mediated by an alternative pathway because you can get it from foods, which is why humans, adult humans, will still express this chemical. Okay, uh, potentially affecting recognition. Yeah, I, it's kind of pointless to read about it. It's just, it's just a unique gene that we've lost. So this one gets a true butt. Blood types and haplogroups. We've covered this, right? Haplogroups, that's literally, <laughs> like, oops, yeah, covered. That's literally um, expected, right? Like different organisms have different haplogroups. Part of what defines a haplogroup is we're talking usually about specific organisms. And blood types, we share many of them, but also organisms that Romat would consider to be within the same kind have different blood types, like rhesus macaques and Japanese macaques. I don't think that rhesus macaques, which look like this, and Japanese macaques, so rhesus macaques look like this, and Japanese macaques, which look like this, would be considered by Romad to be of a different kind, right? And they have different blood types. So that one gets uh, covered already. Orphan genes, we covered it. Chimps and humans both have their own orphan genes. So does every other animal because an orphan gene is, a, is effectively a lineage specific gene. Humans don't typically have any more than anybody else does. So sorry. <laughs> so let's tally it up. Let's see what we've got here. So, oh, I gave him two for this one. I'm gonna go with true butt here. We'll just keep it a true butt. So we have a lot of gibberish and we have an enormous number of true butts. And then we also have quite a few just plain false. So was anything just true? No, but I also didn't make that a category because I knew ahead of time none of it was anything but, hey, yeah, that is true. That being said, so now let's discuss the defining features of humans via raw Matthew, which is so, so, so exciting. So remember, raw Matt thinks that humans include Neanderthals, Denisovans, uh, Homo fluorescensis, et cetera, all other hominins living contemporaneously. And he thinks that like Neanderthals and Denisovans and Homo fluorescensis have experienced like genetic entropy <laughs> and that they are like degraded versions, which is like they look weird. Okay, so number one, a subcutaneous fat layer. I have also not included the numerous repeats that we see um, that we see in uh, his ape classification. So he'll just repeat them. He'll be like, well, a defining characteristic of apes is that they have a rectangular palate. And a defining characteristic of humans is that they have a parabolic palate. It's like, yeah, I know. You, you already said that. Um, so subcutaneous fat layer. We have a massive subcutaneous fat layer because humans endurance run, right? We're really, really good at storing fat. And we have to be because we're the most active of the great apes. Uh, seriously, I know that seems <laughs> that seems kind of silly, but we actually move a lot more than our sedentary cousins do in our hunter-gatherer context. I'm putting true butt here because they do have subcutaneous fat layers, but they're just really reduced compared to ours. Um, human scalp has a unique structure. This is gibberish. That's all he says. I have absolutely no idea what he's talking about. So that gets a G. Hair versus fur, we've already covered this. They're the same thing, right? Unless Ramat feels that he can confidently tell me the difference in that one picture that I showed where we look at electron scanning microscopy of chimps, orangs, and Slavic men, <laughs> then that's, um, you know, that's too bad. Your hair is just the same thing as fur, right? Sorry. Humans manufacture melanin. So this is an interesting one. I think, do only humans have melanin? Melanin. I think that this is not the case that only humans have it. Melanin is also found in reptiles, amphibians, and fish, which is super interesting, but I want to see if it's found in any other mammals. Some humans have very little to no melanin from albinism, right? Let's see if we can find any other critters that have it. In human skin, eumelanin. Okay, wait a second. <laughs> So it looks like there are numerous different types of melanin. And I'm thinking that what Romat has probably done here, and I don't know this for sure, we're about to find out, is that Romat probably thinks that subcategories of melanin don't count as the same thing. So he's gonna be like, look, humans have this kind of melanin and other critters have this kind of melanin, so it's not the same thing. 
Okay, melanin is important in mammalian pigmentation. Okay, so it's in it's in mammals. Um, that's pretty funny. And it's in plants too. <laughs> so what's okay? So boy, it sure seems like there was a, a basic melanin structure that was then undergoing environmental adaptation in various different environments and habitats, um, almost evolving for specific contexts. So I'm going to put a true but here, true but, because humans are not the only ones that manufacture melanin. We might do it in a specific way, but that makes sense because as I showed with the skin map ooh, earlier, we have a broad range. Humans are frugivores, just plain false. I already covered this. Ramat is kind of a crazy person when it comes to how he eats. Human sweat glands. This gets a true but. I have a whole video on this. The, the evolution of our specific eccrine sweat glands and how many we have is directly in relation to the one, the loss of hair that we have, and two, our lifestyles of being endurance runners. And Brocco and Wardicke's area gets a true butt as well. These are special areas that we have, and when we do endocasts of other primates, of other extinct hominins, what we see is these areas are slowly becoming larger, right? As the brain size overall increases, we can see a selection for these areas, although we, this is very vague, and you, a lot of that, I have to admit, is definitely speculation where it's like, okay, this region of the brain is getting larger. Perhaps that could be because we're seeing the, the um, adaptation and development of these, um, of these regions. But, sorry, my ears keep popping because I've got like a cold or something. But like I said, <laughs> humans are different from other apes. Chimps are different from other apes. Gorillas are different from other apes. Gibbons are different from other apes. Orangs are different from other apes. They all have things that make them unique. And in humans, it just so happens we've put all our eggs in the cognition basket. So what it seems to me here is that Ramat has listed all of the things that he thinks are different. He also missed a lot of things. There are lots of things that are unique to humans, um, like our locomotion style, which is in direct relation to our, our skeletal structure, these kinds of things um, that he could have mentioned but didn't because it's very clear that he's like getting this as a list from somewhere, which is fine, whatever. But the take home here should be, these are the differences he could come up with. The rest is the same. We have all the same bones. We have all the same organs. We have all the same regions of our brain or general regions of our brains. We have all of the same um, teeth. Our dental formula is identical. We get many, many, many of the same diseases, unfortunately, and can spread them to one another. And by and large, we develop in the same way. We have large brain to body size ratios. We have the Y5 molar pattern. We have skeletal similarities that just go so, so deep. Um, and that's reflected in our DNA similarity, which is we share 98.8% of our coding base pairs and 96% of our like non-coding base pairs. So, I mean, I don't know, or when non-coding regions are included rather. So I don't know how else to put it. You know, I mean, you're an ape, sorry. Uh, you know, I think it's pretty cool, but whatever. So let's continue now that we've finished up raw mat's best shot at differentiating and realized most of it is uh or actually maybe like a third of it is just plain wrong a third of it is misrepresented and a third of it is gibberish let's continue and nearly finish for our text here so he goes <clears throat> let's not forget what the actual dictionary definition of human is either human, essentially a person distinguished from an animal, from Google Dictionary, page 63, go see for yourself. Okay, is that a threat, Ramat? <laughs> Ramat does sometimes tell people that he's gonna break them in half online, so that's, you know, really good. He's, that kind of sounds like something a chimp would do, you know? Um, sound it out again with me. A human, a person, as distinguished, hold on, let me pull it up here, see. As distinguished from an animal, he's very mad there. I don't give a single shit about the dictionary definition. We're talking about empirical science here, right? Um, and while you can use human to distinguish from other animals, right? You still can't get around the fact that categorically when you try to classify life, that's where you land. As you can see, 
Evolution believers are looking far too hard for similarities to even notice the vast majority of differences. They swindle man into the ape family taxonomically by finding only similarities we share, and pretend that that's all it takes to prove commonality. A pathetic excuse for anyone scientifically minded to condone. You don't get to say anything about science when you don't know the number of bones that you have in your arms and legs. <laughs> Telling kids they are nothing but apes and that evolution is a fact is by far the worst thing you could possibly do to the mind of a human being. Sir, this is an Arby's. The side effects later in life are so harmful that those who believe it to be true lead the world into depression, medication intake, suicide, and school shootings. Okay, Ramat. Cool. Because, <laughs> you know, like, Oh, this is a little controversial, but it's like, you know, like, like religion isn't responsible for any of those things, right? Like, what most people don't know is that taxonomists have, or taxonomists have a problem of their own, and it's called the taxonomic boundary paradox. The concept for a taxon today is that it can overlap in the past, according to evolutionary theory, according to the evolution theory they now believe in. Ramat doesn't know about phylogenetics. I kid you not. Like, that's why he's doing the Linnaean thing in this whole book. Because the taxonomic boundary paradox was specifically, like, solved by phylogenetics. This is why taxonomists are constantly moving and placing things in different tree branches. Are they really doing that more than the distal ends, like more than at the species level? No, the answer is no. But originally, this was not a problem for taxonomy as it was invented by Christian creationists who stated animal families, animal families were fixed. Just like Darwin divided humans up into different races, <laughs> evolutionists have now come up along and called man an ape today. Darwin was an abolitionist, you dumb. <sighs> Raw mat. Darwin was an abolitionist. I, I need to reframe. I'm being too mean to you, but you are just, you are just an imbecile sometimes. I, re I know that's really mean to say, but this is like, I wouldn't say it if I didn't know, like, how you, you behaved as well as I did. I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. But like, I know for a fact that this has been explained to you. So, and I would rather not characterize you as a liar, in which case you have to be ignorant. So, Darwin was an abolitionist. They call us, oh, and also like, was it like evolutionists who were responsible for like antebellum slavery in the South? I mean, was it, were they using like on the origin of species to justify that? Like, oh, sorry, late antebellum South south after slavery was abolished do you think that was was that them or was it people trying to use like certain religious texts to justify it i don't know they call us by hex higher taxonomic names because they know it will sway a child's mind the the shadowy cabal of evolutionists trying to win the youth of tomorrow as if they haven't already Carl Linnaeus believed that he was God's chosen instrument for revealing in a precise way the divinely ordered works of creation. As a creationist, he in initially shared the then prevalent view that each species had been originally created by God, blah, 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 blah. I don't really care about any of this. Um, he's just mischaracterizing Linnaeus, too. Um, then he goes, okay, Latin. He's. <laughs> this is so funny because he just got mad at English for, like, making this hard on him. And then now he's like, look at English. Latin In Latin, homo means human. Okay, all right, let's see. He's talking about, I don't care about any of this. But we now know the truth. Gene sequences show that humans are nearly identical to one another, no matter how back, how, how back, why can't I talk today? No matter how far back in time you go, it doesn't matter if they're Neanderthal or Denisovans or where in the world you test people, we're all related. True, and we're related to chimps too by that same exact method. Where's the line? Why do you draw it there? Why does it work between humans and Neanderthals who are 99.7, but not humans and, and chimpanzees who are 98.8? If humans are animals, then how come human rights and animal rights are completely different? This is this is like baby argument, right? Like this is like a if a, you ask a toddler this question or like a six-year-old. Why is it okay to shoot a deer but not shoot your hunting buddy? You eat animals daily, but you don't eat people. Why is that? <laughs> bestiality and cannibalism is frowned upon. That's putting it lightly. <laughs> it is unacceptable and illegal for humans to engage in interspecies erotica and in <laughs> engage or and to eat other people. Why is that? You got it. It's because people are not animals and animals are not people. I mean, 
what a weird way to end this, right? It, what a what a bizarre way to end that chapter. Whatever floats your boat, Ramat. Okay, closing. Taxonomy was first invented by Christian creationists, so we own the hierarchies that evolution tries to use against us today. I want you to see how he spelled hierarchies there. And the underscored we. Um, yeah, Linnaeus lumped humans and the rest of the apes, like, broadly speaking, together. So, sure, if you want to own that, do it. Two, if we must accept that humans are apes, then we must equally accept that humans are monkeys, and that is 100% wrong. No, it's not. You're a monkey too, Ramat. Humans were not placed in with apes. Primates were placed with humans because anthropomorpha means man-like. True, yes. When taxonomy was stolen by evolutionists, it became an intermediate immediate paradox called the taxonomic boundary paradox because things were once set within boundaries and now have overlap in the past. Hence phylogeny. Thus, classification breaks down going back in time. He literally doesn't know about phylogeny, guys. He just, he doesn't know about it. Okay, let's see. Okay, then he uses the... He uses the R slur here, but he he actually spells it wrong, which is incredible. Right there. Let me see. He uses a D. Awesome. You love to see it. I do not have enough faith in evolution to believe that every single beneficial physiological factor micro evolved out of us and into oblivion for no good reason at all. This again, this is like <laughs> this is like um this is like Power Rangers on like a Saturday morning cartoon logic. That nonsense doesn't belong anywhere near a classroom and scientists should step back and evaluate what they were taught in school before accepting non-logical storytelling. Most of us were taught evolution five days a week in our entire childhood through school. Where did you go to school? I want to send my kids there. Programming is deeply rooted in us all and by the time you have made a career of it, it will be nearly impossible to break free. If you do not, you can't. If you do, you cannot even mention it because your job is on the line or worse. Evolution has become one of the largest religions on earth and that's how it ends. <laughs> he leaves us hanging. I kid you not, it just ends in and and then it shows a cartoon. An editor would fix things like this, guys. And then it goes right into about the author. Standing for Truth is a man behind the Team SFT YouTube channel and creation ministry. He has authored the books, and then he shills for his books, with creation apologist Ramat. And then he talks about debating people. And then that's it. You can help us win the war against the philosophy of evolutionism. You guys are about a century too late on that one. Uh, and then he's got a glossary. And that's it. That's the end of the book. We beat it. We finished it. Which is amazing, I gotta, I gotta say. Um, so, let's go write our Amazon review. So, here's the review that I've drummed up. Obviously, it gets one star. My headline is, my education is in primatology and human evo, most of this is gibberish, and I've included a library of error picture, just so everyone knows who this is. I want to be in as gutsick gibbon, and here's what I have to say. This text is an all-star mashup of ignorance and what can only be understood as intentional misdirection. I read and annotated this text from cover to cover, and I can say with certainty that I have never read anything quite so consistently incorrect. From the first sentence to the last word, this thing is chock full of inaccuracies and misrepresentation. The only thing more impressive than the information deficit is the uncanny ability to cram more typos, clickable hyperlinks, and the odd slur, which was of course spelled wrong, into the 150 plus pages than I thought possible given the authors are adults. The text acts as a monument to the negatives of the self-publishing era we now live in, revealing it is truly possible for a PDF to be printed and disseminated on paper using 16 point font uncredited pictures, misaligned page numbers, and a bibliography of blue hyperlinks, which are of course unclickable given this is a hard copy text. If you find this to be hard to believe, revel in the fact that I took over 10 hours and reviewed every sentence of this book, explaining why it is incorrect and noting the many crimes against science and proper editing. Then I link my playlist. A better use of your money would be to simply light it on fire and enjoy the brief warmth that it provides. I would simply burn this text for my heat for heat for myself, but it is far too soggy. 
with bullshit to light. And so with that, may, we may return at long last the Standing for Truth text to its prison where it belongs. And we may erase this chapter from our lives and forget that this book ever existed. Moving on to the next text, which will be Contested Bones. I'm very excited for this one. This is going to be interesting. As for after Contested Bones, I don't know. Maybe we'll maybe we'll do another Standing for Truth book. He certainly has enough of them, and I, I do like providing the reasons why these things are incorrect. This also means that for a long time, I will be saying nothing about Standing for Truth or his YouTube channel. This was kind of my uh, last hurrah dealing with them unless we do another one of their books, which depending on how bad they are, and maybe we will, I don't know. Um, that channel is, I guess I should say my final thoughts on that, on, on the authors as people. Although, um, I don't really know, I don't really know that that's like the purpose of this review. Really and truly, we're just looking at the information. But what I can, I suppose, say is that, as I've said many times before, the authors are not interested, it seems, in the truth of the matter. That doesn't so much um, resonate with them as does the idea of team sports and making sure that they have some kind of rebuttal. Whether the rebuttal is correct or not doesn't matter as long as there is one to propose, which is why I try to take it upon myself to show why these rebuttals are incorrect when they are indeed egregiously so. So, I suppose I would say to the authors of this text, who almost certainly watch these videos, do better. Do better. And um, maybe, maybe do a little bit more research before you commit to putting something to paper. Because that thing is in my hands forever. You can't change the mistakes that are in it. They're permanent. So think a bit harder before you go forth and publish something else. Um, and so with that, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes, I think I'm going to go ahead and close. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah.